Hey, what's up everybody? Matt Bell here with Electric Violin Shop. I feel like it's been forever since I've been in front of this glorious wall. I've been doing so much traveling. Um, I hope you guys have enjoyed having the guest hosts. Uh, it's been really fun for me to watch everybody's videos that they're doing. We're actually going to have another guest host next week. I'm going to be at the University of Illinois doing some coursework there. Uh, Raz is going to do some... Uh, some a guest host for you guys next week, and she's gonna be talking about all kinds of raztastic stuff. Uh, what's up, Lance? Good to see you. We are continuing our series. We've been trying to do interviews with all of the manufacturers of the instruments that we have, and we've talked to some really cool folks. The last one we did, we did an interview with the folks in Aurora in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, today, we have got the largest manufacturer of musical instruments on the planet. We've got uh, Yamaha and uh, we're going to be talking to Ken Datmore at Yamaha. He's in Los Angeles. So let's just pop over and talk to Ken. What's happening, man? Hey, Matt. The so, largest uh, manufacturer, we have a statistics that says every of, of every four musical instruments sold, one is a Yamaha. In the world? In the world. Wow. 25% of the instruments on the planet are a Yamaha instrument. That's amazing. That's a lot of drum sets. <laughs> My goodness, that's a lot of drum sets. And clarinets. And, and uh, in fact, uh, you guys debuted a new acoustic violin at NAMM a couple years ago, back pre-plague, when we used to actually all gather in the same room and breathe each other's air and stuff. Um and uh, they, the Yamaha actually asked me to play the thing. I think it's because the call time was, was 5 a.m. and nobody else would do it. You didn't even know 5 a.m. existed. I, I, you know, I've been to bed at 5 a.m. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get up at 5. But, uh, yeah, you guys had a new student violin, and it was, it's just an example of the way Yamaha is constantly innovating and doing new things. This, this violin, they take the top. This is not a Yamaha violin. My apologies. But they take the, uh, the instrument, you know how the, the sides of these things are, are arched. And, it, and so the traditional method is doing this is you take a thick piece of wood and you carve the arch into the wood. And what Yamaha sort of figured out was, A, that's not extremely repeatable. B, it uses a whole lot of wood. And C, it costs a lot of money. So what if, you know, Yamaha is really good at bending wood. I mean, they, are, they make drum shells. So why wouldn't we just cut out a flat template of the front of the violin and then press it into that arched shape? And it becomes extremely repeatable. It's much more environmentally friendly and it's cheaper. And it makes a great sounding student violin. I was really impressed by how good that instrument sounded for the price point that it was at. Um, and that's just an example of the innovation that Yamaha is doing and that's the kind of thing you can do when you're a huge global company and you can afford to pour that kind of money into R&D. Yeah, that, that, the big feature of that instrument, too, is besides the, the, uh, the pressed arching, was that there was a graduation in it as well. Was that we actually took, a, um, a, took a, an Italian violin and they scanned it in a CAD machine and then they said, make this image flat. And the, uh, so the image becomes a flat image. And then we take a, 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 like a one eighth inch piece of spruce and carve that graduated, you know, the, the distorted graduation into the flat, uh, into the flat piece. And then when we bend it, all of those graduation points return to the original place as if it were actually carved. So, so you're getting a, a, a press top instrument that has a graduation in it, and that's never been done before. And it uses one third the amount of wood. So sustainability, what would normally end up, you, you, use, you use one third of the piece of wood and then two thirds of it end up on the floor right. in shavings and saw, sawdust. We get three tops out of it and almost, uh, with, the, with the exception of, of some sawdust from the carving process, the graduation process, that's it. So. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. for, so for the people who don't know Ken Datmore, can you tell them what your role is at, at, uh, at Yamaha? What's your title there? I am, uh, I am actually a tuba player by trade. I, would, I uh, went to uh, 
I went to school for music and business and uh, from New York and I returned to New York and I was on a going to a gig and I was walking down the street with my tuba and I bumped into uh, uh, a, an old woman who fell over and, and she said some words to me in a language I did not understand. <laughs> and ever since then, I've been I've been wandering the world for eternity selling violins. <laughs> That's, That's awesome. my story, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm <laughs> yeah. <sticking> to it, but <laughs> stick to it, man. Just hang on to that with both hands. I I, I actually said that you know being an, a non-violin player has been a, a a benefit to me in in the roles that I've had in in business because I don't have any preconceived mm -hmm. opinions on something. I, you know, a lot of violin players with that they they hear things that. Us tuba players don't hear like they'll they'll start talking about about sound in terms of color. You know, I want to I want to this one sounds a, it has a pink sound to it. And I'm looking for a little bit more of an a magenta sound to it. And the, and at that point, I just become the shoe salesman and I go in the back and I get them something. and I keep going back and get them something until they get until they put their foot into something that they like and then. And and then it's all customer service after that. Just take it once once the once the sale's been executed, you take care of the customer after that. I say all the tuba notes, those are all brown, aren't they? They're all 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 brown. <laughs> all brown. Yep. This is from a trumpet player here. I was a trumpet player many, many moons ago. <laughs> so one of the questions we get about Yamaha is just like you guys make so many different instruments. I wanted to take you, you sent me some information yesterday and I, I want to sort of go through that with everybody and we'll just sort of talk about the instruments that Yamaha offers right now. And then we'll take a look at some of the historical instruments when those were produced because uh, there's a lot of people that still talk about some like the EV204, EV205. Um, and then we'll start taking questions from you guys. We got a bunch of people here. Matus is here, Debbie's here, Nikki, Eduardo, what's up guys? Um, so yeah, I guess we'll just go back and look at, let's see, let's start with the YEV. This is by far the best-selling instrument that we have. Um, and we, we sell these things by the truckload. And a lot of people will ask, is it a YEV or a YEV? I mean, either one, I'm going to know what it is if you, if you say a YEV or a YEV. But, um, you know, people will ask about what are, what are all the... The 104 NTs and BLs, and, and so this is just so you guys can see what that whole code means. Um, and then here are here's a little bit of information on the design of, of the YEV with the whole Mobius strip thing. Yes, that was completely intentional. Um, and you can just sort of see, I, I didn't realize that that space from the side was like designed to visually represent the, the resonant body. Um, I just knew that the first time I saw YEV, you guys brought us one of the prototypes. Mm -hmm. We were blown away because it doesn't look like anything Yamaha had ever done. It's way outside the box. And just what an amazing design. That was, that was actually, a, when you take the frame into consideration, the frame is very thin. But what you're looking at is, is five layers of plywood going in various different directions so so there's a there's a vertical uh, piece that's a half a millimeter and then there's a horizontal piece that's a half a millimeter and then another vertical and then another horizontal and then another vertical so you're really looking at a, a pretty a, a, a pretty durable piece of uh, of wood despite the despite the thinness of it and it, it, in the in the beginning, people said, "Well, what happens if I bump it into a, a, a into a music stand?" It's like nothing, or or, or what if I drop it? It's like, well, what happens if you drop your saxophone? <laughs> yeah, um, try, try not to drop it. <laughs> it's gonna. But it's we've we've seen them we've seen them take some some pretty substantial abuse and 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 hang in there. It's not as fragile as it looks. No, I mean we've sold like truckloads of these things and that's a super common question everybody's worried about the durability of of that bout the the sort of the mobius looking thing and i think we had maybe i think we've had two reports of them breaking and one of them somebody had actually backed over it with their car 
um, which will do it every time. And I think the other one was dropped from like head height and landed on blacktop, um, which will also do it. I mean, any other instrument is also going to break in those situations. Right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they're incredibly durable. And uh, so, yeah, that the five layers, I was aware that it was five layers. I don't think I recognized that it was that they're oriented differently, which makes total sense, which is where you get the strength. Yeah, just like uh, just like plywood that goes into making a house. That's instead of uh, in, instead of uh, three quarters of an inch thick. It's well, probably well, five, five times. It's two and a half millimeters. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, the other question that we we'll sometimes get is that uh, the mahogany and spruce, um, the stripes that you see in the natural one, um, it says here that the black one is the same construction. It's just it's painted over, so it's 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 the exact same instrument. It just has a paint job. That's correct. Yeah, I've been to the factory and I did take a picture of that. To, so I, I have proof. <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's the same. the uh, The frame itself is also walnut. So if you look at the instrument, I think there there's let's see, ma mahogany, spruce, maple, ebony pegs, walnut, and the uh, um, the, the the stop that would norm that you would normally hit with the it would right. be the it would yeah, be the, the upper bow the instrument that uh, that's uh, that uh, that's beechwood so i think there are like seven different uh, the the fingerboard is rosewood it's it's got about seven different species of wood in it yeah they're super beautiful um, and then of course one of the one of the things that people really like is you've got a super inexpensive instrument that doesn't sound like a super inexpensive instrument uh, it's the it's the same passive bridge from the sv250 correct correct yes yeah. and then we, uh yep go ahead yeah we we tasked our, our design team with getting this all put together at a very specific price point and that price point was the price point of an ipad wow Be because because we knew everybody has an ipad um every Every kid in school has an iPad because they need one on it. And, and when we go to educator shows, the kids will play these things. And of course, they love the way it looks and they love the way it the, And then, you know, when, when, uh, when, when they ask how much it is, I say, how much do you think it is? And they'll say $1,500, $1,800. And then when I tell them the price and they realize that that's about the price of their iPad, then they know they can get their parents to buy them one, and then the the face lights up, and 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 they're on board. And you know, we we it, it's it's a it's it's a easy way to make a customer when you have a product like that at a, at a price that that's so affordable. To, yeah, I mean, I'd say even if it's not your primary instrument, if you play something else, there there's almost no reason to not have a YEV in your collection you know you talk to guitar players and they've all got a dozen guitars yeah. at that price point and the way it sounds and the quality of construction there's there's almost no reason to not have one and and, and the way the world's coming now is that is that the, the day is coming where violinists are going to be like guitar players you're going to have to show up with your acoustic instrument and your electric instrument especially in the studio when when we when we do the nam show here we get so many studio players that visit the, the nam show and they come to the booth and the first thing they say is i need to have an electric instrument because the engineers in a recording studio don't want to mess around with mic and an acoustic instrument they just want to plug in and send a signal to the board and do the rest from there yeah absolutely so it, it, and it's 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 and it's becoming more of a necessity for them, for sure. And it, you know, a lot of people ask too. Well, it's an entry level price, right? So it's probably going to sound like a student instrument, and it doesn't. We've got art, artists like Martha Mook, who is a world renowned player, and uh, played with David Bowie and and everybody else. And that's her main axe is the YEV. Right. 
So uh, yeah, the the same the same bridge pickup that the 250 or the two the 255 have. Um, a lot of people will ask about this. We did an FAQ, a frequently asked questions video about the YEV a while back. So if you guys have more questions about that, you can hit up the uh, FAQ video we've got. But one of the uh, one of the things people ask about is that switch on the back. Um, were you involved in the decision making process on that button at all? That was that was the design team that did that, but um, it ended up being a, a pretty cool idea because what it lets you do is it it's a it's kind of an active passive. You can disable. You've got one one of them's a volume control, and the other one is a switch that turns that knob off. So if you want to go direct out, you can turn it off, or if you if you activate it, then you have some control over the uh, over over the volume. What some players do is that they turn the volume down on the instrument, and then they leave it. They leave it passive, so the uh, um, so the signal goes directly out out to the house. But when they want to turn that signal off, they actually activate they activate the electronics with the volume turned all the way down, mm. and it mutes it. Yeah, you can use it like a mute or a boost button, or a boost. Yes. So uh, we have a question from Eduardo here. Is the sound on the YEV a lot different from the old SV-130? Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's a lot different. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's a lot different. That, that instrument was, well, that instrument was, was designed to be a, a silent practice instrument, mm -hmm. which, is, which is what the, in the days of SV-100, that's what it was. It was developed in the, for the Japanese market where everyone lives 10 feet away from each other and people wanted to practice their instrument without disturbing their neighbors or, or the people that they live with. And it took off as a practice instrument and sold very well in the Japanese market. So they introduced it to the U S market and said, here, this is a, this is a, this is a, a silent practice violin. You can, you can practice with it. And that's all it was intended to do. Right. Um, you know, just a, just enough electronics to feed into the earbuds, and it and of course when it got to the United States, Americans being American said, "Hey, cool, silent violin. Let's plug it into an amplifier and see how loud we can make it." That's right. That's what we do. Yeah, and and the result was not very good because the electronics were not designed to be played through an amplifier. It was just designed to to feed into those those earbuds and while you practice with it so it went through several generations uh it became a 110 it became a 120 and it ended up a 130 right each one of them improved the sound and made it more of a performance instrument so, and then from that there was the the 200 right was designed and i always said you know there it wasn't it was never a matter of of good better and best and that it was a matter of of, of the the intent the in, your intent to use it so if you wanted to practice 80 percent and not bother people but when mm -hmm. grandma came over on the weekends or a sunday in church you wanted to pr perform with your with your electric violin you could do that when it got to the 200 that flipped the, the 200 was meant for the performer who was on stage every night and he was performing uh, or he or she were performing 80% of the time, but the 20% of the time they still wanted to be able to practice in a hotel room or tour bus or something, something like that. So that, and that, and that moved up to uh, um, two pickups in that instrument. So it was a much more, much stronger output, sound output. From yeah. there, and then, yeah. and then that's where it's it's discontinued now. It's been replaced by SV250, but there was a there was a YEV 104 and 105, and that was where we took guitar engineers and said, "Here, make a violin." Mm. And of course, they made a they they made a they made a guitar that was shaped like a violin, right? Essentially, are you talking uh, the EV 204 and 205? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it had a it had a strong strong output, um, very electric sounding, yep. very friendly to processing. If you wanted to, to process, it'd love to be processed. 
Yeah, we've got a uh, we've got a used one and in the house is. right here. So uh, anybody out there want one of these vintage instruments? We got one, man. They they even went so far in that model, the uh, the the guitar engineers is that there are five different pickups in that one. There's a pickup for each string, and if you open up the battery compartment, there's a volume control for each one of the pickups. Yep. So that if if you want more. If you want the upper strings accented more than the lower strings, depending on maybe the venue you were playing in, you all you had to do is pop that open and and adjust the uh, uh, adjust the, uh, the the string volumes independently. Yeah, that was a cool instrument. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to get back to you talked about that the uh, the original the practice violin um, that sort of evolved into the SV one hundred and fifty which is now evolved into the YSV-104. So I've got that up on the screen now. And uh, so, yeah, the YSV-104 is back to that same concept of being a practice instrument only, where it comes out, you've got a wire that goes from the instrument to a control box, and then that goes to your headphones. Um, but this isn't like the SV-150 in it. It's just amplified. There's some technology that makes this sound very much like an acoustic violin it, i mean it sounds a lot like an acoustic violin in your in your ears even even to the point where i don't know if you've if, if you've noticed it but when you're playing it and you have the earbuds in it gives the illusion that the sound is coming from underneath your chin yeah i don't think i noticed that but that's that's an intentional yeah. thing that's an intentional thing yeah wow yeah it's a it's a, it's almost like you don't notice it until if it, you know, if you tell somebody, then they'll, they'll then they'll notice it right away. It's like, you know, where's the sound coming from? It's, it's coming from underneath your chin, isn't it? And when they go back and play it, they'll hear they'll hear it then. Yeah, you know? that's a magical voodoo right there. The, the, the player's so used to hearing the sound from from underneath the chin when when they hear it in in the uh, in the in the YSV, they don't realize it that it's that it's being done electronically. Oh, yeah. that's crazy. Man, see all these smart people working on stuff? And then the next one we've got on the screen now is the 200, where you talked about this is sort of where it crossed over, that this is more a performance instrument that can also be used for practice. That's correct, yeah. And then the 250 and 255, which is what, like, Lindsey Sterling and Kev Marcus and, and Christian Howes and those guys play. Yeah, that's the... That's the you, you can you can do silent practice with it with the control box that the, the control box that comes with it has a uh, uh, has a uh, it actually has an aux in and uh, and an earbud output earphone output on it so you can practice si silently but the intention for this one is just that screaming professional sound that. You know, just feed feed the signal out to to the front of your your front of house guys and let them and, and let them take it from there. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, these are played on on the very biggest stages that there are. You know, I don't yeah. I don't know. If there's many bigger stars than than Lindsay or or the guys in Black Violin. I mean, those are very very large stages. It's 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 lightweight, um, which is what drew Lindsay to it. So Chris Lindsay is only about, boy, I bet you that maybe a little bit over five feet, somewhere between maybe five one, yeah, five two, and and for her to run around on stage with a with a typical a typical solid body electric electric violin it takes it takes a lot out of her, and when she when she realized how how close to the the, the weight of a uh, of, of an acoustic instrument it was that's what uh, that, that's what that's what made her um, made her want to want to make the jump to the to the uh, the SV250 she plays the four string yeah i think anything that weighed more than that she'd just tump over she's really little <laughs> you know and of course what she does she just requires an incredible amount of balance to do what she's doing and any amount of weight that's different you know she's already got arms out to one side and she's got more weight that's, there than she needs that could be exactly. a career changer for her exactly yeah the other thing about that instrument too is that we started 
it, it actually started with a base. This is something that, we, that our engineers do, and they call it they call it vertical in, integration. That if it benefits one player, it should be able to benefit all. Mm. And when we did the when we did the base, the the SLB two hundred, the innovation in that is is that the, the it has a hollow chamber inside of it. It it was it, it was carved out like a canoe, and when you look at the side of the instrument, you'll see slits in it. Those slits are essentially an F hole. Okay. Now, after it was done on the base, it was done in the cellos with SV SVC two ten and SVC 110 that so it moved from the bass to the cello and at S, S, SV 250 SV 255 it moved to the violin so the the violin has a has a slight hollow chamber inside of it and that really makes a big difference in the in the sound it gives it much more of an acoustic sound there's a there's a there's a body of air inside that instrument that that resonates Mm. when you play the instrument yeah so you're still getting that that sound bouncing inside of wood type sound mm -hmm. right right so it turns out we're not just um you know it's not just violinists you know there's also uh there's also violists out there believe it or not and uh so the svv 200 um is built on the svv 200 platform but it's a 16 inch viola size Right, right, and if and if you're if you're up to speed on your viola jokes, you can say it burns longer. Oh man! Okay, I I, I <laughs> saw that one time, and there was a viola player in there. He was he was ready to throw a book at me. Yeah, throw a <laughs> viola at you. <laughs> and then you know we've got our friends down at the bottom end holding it down. They're putting down the rhythm so us violinists can play all the cool stuff. Um, <laughs> wait, that didn't come out right. Um. Yeah, so we're, we're looking at the SVC-50 now, the cello. Um, yeah, talk about, we're going to look at the 50, the 110, and the 210, if you want to talk about some of the differences there. The, uh, the 50 was developed, um, it's, a, it's a solid body. It doesn't have a resonating chamber in it. But the intention there was, as, as we started to, uh, people, people wanted to have quartets, electric quartets and and schools especially uh, that a lot of a lot of educators said you know this would be a great way to 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 recruit for my program and and retain my kids for this program if they could have electric instruments and play what's in and and play what they're what they're listening to on youtube and and on the radio instead of you know you're not going to get an electric quartet and sit down and and practice your 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 Christmas carols or or or, uh, or 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 Bach or Beethoven or anything like that with with electric instruments you're going to want to plug them into plug them into effects boxes and things so so that whole idea of, of using it as as a as a recruitment and retention tool for for educators um, necessitated uh, silent quartets and. The SVC 50 was an was an inexpensive way to put that quartet together, so that a, a school didn't bust its budget for instrument purchases for the whole year, just because they bought an electric quartet. That it at that price, they could they could get a quartet in affordable enough. You know, they they didn't have to spend three thousand dollars on a cello, right. just the cello alone. Right, that so so that was the the purpose of that, and we, and we offer three different court. There's suggested quartet configurations, so so the the upgrade, the the upgrade, the the, the low side of it would be two YEVs, uh, uh, an SVV 200 viola, and an SVC 50 cello, mm -hmm. least expensive option. That's the entry level. The upgrade from there is we keep the uh, SVC 50 and we keep the SVV 200 viola, but we upgrade the violins to SV 200 violins. Mm. And then to really splurge for the, the 
the people, the the schools that can uh, the, that that have the budget to do it. It's the uh, um, we would recommend SV SV two fifty or SV two hundred, and then SVV two hundred viola, and then upgrade the cello to SVC one ten. And those are the that's the configuration where those instruments really like the set. They really play well with each other. Mm. They all have the same, the 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 similar similar sound, and and they blend together well, and they create a pretty acoustic sound. Not 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 totally acoustic. They're electric instruments. They're never going to be totally sure. acoustic, but the the very a very clear acoustic sound. Yeah, the SVC right, uh, 110 is one that's got the bout that's a little more complete and looks has right. more of a cello outline. I like yeah. the the 50 and the 210 still have all the contact points. It still touches your chest. You still got a bout where your hand is going to feel as you're shifting, and then you you've also got a place for your knees. Uh, but the 110 is the one that looks a little bit more like a cello outline. Right, right, and that and that heavier. That heavier frame gives it a little bit more resonance mm -hmm. to it, so it sounds it tends to sound a little bit more acoustic, because that the the other the other two travel better. They fold right. up and and you know the 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 sides break down and and you can put it in. I always say back back in the old days you could put that in an overhead in a in a in a plane. And now my answer now does it fit into an overhead? It's like well. Nothing fits in an overhead anymore <laughs> because everybody's got their everybody's got their rollerboards up there. So you, you know, but yep. for for transportation purposes, if you're going to fly with the instruments, the uh, the the SVC 50 and the SV, uh, SVC 210, when they're folded up and in their bag, you take a trip down to your local golf retail store mm -hmm. and they've got travel cases for golf clubs that, you know, you're going to, you're going to go on vacation. You, you drop your bag of golf clubs into, into that case. Yep. And they're not too expensive for you know, between one fifty two hundred dollars $200 and the instrument fits inside of that. And it's very well protected so that you, you don't have to worry about handing it over to the airline. Um, because they're just going to treat it like it's a set of golf clubs. Yeah, I think Tino Guo is the one that turned me on to that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she's touring with Hans Zimmer all across the world, and and right. figured out how to travel with her SVC 210, which is right. actually what you hear on Wonder Woman, by the way, when you listen to the uh, the Wonder Woman soundtrack. That's not a guitar that you're hearing. That's Tina Guo and her uh, her SVC 210. Mm -hmm. And the uh, and the one the 110 with the frame. That's an easy solution. Uh, a standard a standard full size hard shell cello case goes, it goes, drops right into it, fits it perfectly. And so finishing up cello world, we're getting into the base. We've got the, uh, the SVB, the 300, the, uh, the new product that just came out at the, the last NAM show. Um, that thing sounds incredible. This was, this was something that started with, with with guitars and moved to piano, and now it's coming over into the 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 electric string side of the products, and of course the bass gets it first because the bass is the biggest instrument, and it has the it has the purest sound. If you if you took an acoustic bass and you put it on an oscilloscope and plucked the string, you would see this perfect S wave, mm. just, you know, just, just a easy, easy signal to it. Um, and SRT is, is called, uh, studio response technology. And even when I first heard about it, I thought it was sampling that there was some kind of sampling being done and it's not, um, uh, what they did was, what they did was they, they took a, a an old, uh, uh, an old German bass, a vintage German bass, and they recorded it. They uh, they sampled the sound of it with three different microphones. So the first microphone is a is a is a vintage um, tube microphone. The second microphone was uh, was a dynamic microphone, and then the third microphone was was uh, was that big fat you know chocolate 
you know, Ver, Verdine White. Mm. I mean, you know, that, that that funky, heavy sound, right? It, and and what it lets you do is it's it starts with the it starts with the acoustic sound of the instrument, and and if you turn the SRT off, that's just the sound of the instrument as it sounds. Once you deploy the SRT technology, you have control over not just which microphone you want to use, but how much of it you want to use. So it, it would be it would be comparable to moving the microphone, having an acoustic instrument and moving the microphone away from the instrument or closer to the instrument. You can actually blend you can actually blend that sound in. So when a player gets to a venue, um, based on the acoustic properties of the venue and the style of music that they're playing and and the, the, the type of ensemble that they have, they can they can they can tailor their sound on the fly right right on the spot. So it gives it it, it gives total control of the sound to the player. Yeah, that um, modeling has gotten so good. I mean I remember hearing it at the NAM show and it sounds like an acoustic bass with a mic on it. It's it's really incredible. Yeah, yeah, and something to look forward to. Remember, uh, remember, I said uh, the vertical integration. Your your cellos are going to have it next, and the violins are going to violins are going to get their hands on it at some point too. So, I'm looking forward to it. So when we when we model the sound of a Guarneri or we model the sound of a Strad or something, <laughs> I'm ready, man. I'm ready. Send it this way. So we got a couple of questions I want to get to before we go any further. Eduardo is asking, "Is it? This is a super common question we get. Is it possible to play the SV250 without the control box in case we need the mobility?" We developed this, or actually, we actually had to develop it in the in the in the first design portion of it. It was uh, it was only it was only the box. It, you could only. Uh, you can only use it with the box, and the, the the design of the box was that you could you could strap it to your to your belt, or you could leave it inside of um, your pedal board. That box stayed inside the pedal board, and it what it didn't take into account is Lindsey Sterling, mm -hmm. and you know she wanted the sound, and she wanted to be able to move all over, and even Kev Marcus, and that. So we did develop. A device that that kind of replaces the box, and the sad part about it is we don't sell it. We just we have it available at the at the professional level. So so for the artists who are moving around, it's uh, it, 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 they they have a hack. They ha they have a hack that's not available on the market. I'm sorry to say. Yeah, I was. I would really love to see that uh, you know become a thing that's available. I, I know that you're you're aware of our desire to to have the Lindsay yeah. box available for everybody. Yeah, the future the, the future generations will will eliminate the box mm. all all together, and and that's that's because you know every we learn we learn how to make integrated circuits smaller and smaller every every year. Something's getting smaller and better and and. And more and more powerful. So, sadly, the the, the 250 and 255 are are going to be stepped over for another model that will incorporate that in the future. But it's just not here yet. Is it? Do we have any time frame on that? That I that I, I don't know. They're they're actually um, the the design team right now is concentrating on uh, on getting SRT into the the cellos that's a uh that's a good choice i'm good for that yeah yeah, yeah. we had a, a question here from uh mickey about reshaping the bridge as i found it very high from the factory it turns out mickey that we uh we actually do a free reshaping here at electric violin shop we did a TikTok on this maybe a month or so ago that kind of went viral um so if if you follow us on TikTok. You should follow us on TikTok. If you don't, then uh, do it. Follow us on TikTok. Um, but there, yeah, we did a video where we showed how Jamie hand shapes every bridge that comes on these. And, and I would guess the reason that you guys make these bridges pretty high is that people are, are that's sort of a personal thing, how they want their bridge shaped, right? 
right and uh, and the uh, the physical property of, of, uh, of, of nature that says it's easier to take wood off than it is to put it back on <laughs> yeah it's hard to make one taller yeah it's hard to make one taller so yeah but Yamaha really intentionally good. sends these bridges too tall to really be played properly um, and either have your luthier if you don't buy it from us what are you even doing with your life but um, if for some reason you found one in a ditch and it didn't come from us, then uh, then you can have your luthier hand shape it. Um, but you're better you're better off just buying it straight from us, and we hand shape every one of those that comes out. Um, and that's a that's all the instruments that, that that's all the uh, silent electric instruments that the the bridges tend to be a little thicker and a little higher, and that's so that you can take it to your luthier and have have them put it where you want it. Yep. Um, and it turns out that Yamaha also owns Line 6, one of my favorite other companies. The, uh, the, the customer service that I've received with Line 6, I've been a Line 6 customer for a long time. The, uh, the customer service you get from Line 6, I've never seen in any other big company. It is insane how good their customer service is. Um, so when we talk, I've got some pictures here, Ken, of... Uh, the THR amps, the stage pass system, the session cakes, uh, the Line 6 relay wirelesses, which have been super, super popular with violinists because of that bud style wireless. Um, and then, of course, Yamaha being one of the biggest companies in the world is one of the biggest sound companies, too. They make PAs and amplifiers and mixing consoles and headphones and, you know, everything else. I mean, Yamaha makes... They make motorcycles. They make, of course, they make everything for for uh, for sound as well. Office furniture, um, integrated circuits, uh, kitchen kitchen cabinets, golf clubs, tennis rackets, lawnmowers. It's, you need a lawnmower. Sk skis. Yep. <laughs> yeah, if you need a ski boat and a violin, you, the runner, only place you can buy wave, both. Wave runner. There, there's a there's an article on you know the 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 blog the Onion, yeah. where they do spoof things like that, and, and they they used a, they did one on us where it says we do one thing we do it very well, we make we, we make we make tubas we make trombones we make saxophones we make lawn mowers we make. <laughs> <laughs> And we, we only do one thing, and we do it very well. Yeah, like which is make everything you need. And our tennis rackets, and our, we do one thing very well. <laughs> a Yamaha breakfast cereal coming soon. <laughs> and the funny, the funniest part of that article, if you if you if you hunt it down on Google, it you can still you can still find it. Is that they they quote the president of of Yamaha, the Japanese president, the. And 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 the, the quote the quote comes from him. They they went so far into it to research who the president of the company was, and they used his name as the quote as the the quote in the, in, in the article. So, the the, the the you know internally we just thought that was fantastic. It's like they, boy, those guys are for as funny as they were trying to be. They really did their homework. <laughs> now it's maybe we ought to get these guys a job at CNN or something. I don't know. <laughs> It was, it was, it was, the storytelling might might be more accurate. <laughs> oh my goodness! So, uh, oh, Tara's asking, uh, any plans to make a five-string bass? There, there, it's it's in it's in the future. There, we have a we have a product ro roadmap, and and I can tell you that that's on the uh, that's that's on the roadmap as well as. My my plea to the to the design team is the next thing you design, and I don't care what it is, start with the five string and mm. then make it a four string. Oh so yeah. Whether that gets whether that gets executed remains to be seen. Okay. Uh, and and when and when it gets executed remains to be seen, but that's the the. Speaking on on behalf of Americans, I have I have voiced my opinion. There you go. I've, there was one slide that I forgot to put up here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna import it. You guys are gonna have to sort of watch me go through this. Uh, we're looking at some of the artists here, but I'm gonna import. Here we go. This is the one that it's got the sort of the life cycle 
of, of all of these different um, instruments that have been coming. You can see sort of uh, the history of the, the, uh, the SV100, the SV110. Uh, if you guys want to sort of screenshot this or something, you can sort of see which instruments were available when in history, just in case you're uh, you know, curious and you want to know. You know, gosh, when could you get an EV204? And it was, you know, 2002 through 2010. That's when they were, uh, that's when they were out. So this is just some historical information for you guys about when these different product families came to be and, and, uh, and when they're available. So there you go. Um, yeah, Nick Hyde just put in the, uh, in the comments section, he found the, the Onion article. And uh, so there's a link in the comments section to the Onion articles. Definitely worth, <laughs> yeah, definitely worth taking a look at. Good to see you, Nick. What's going on, buddy? Um, any other questions? You got Ken Datmore, who's who's here with Yamaha, willing to answer questions. He might tell you whether Yamaha is going to make a six-string violin soon. I, we're 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 working on we're working on five. No, the, the the vision is the vision is for five. And I know as soon as we get the six string, you know what the next question is if there's a six string. Yeah. The, five, the five string causes the six string question. The six string causes the seven string question. These low strings are gateway drugs, you know. They are. They are. No. I mean you're a tuba guy. You gotta understand the low frequency, the need for lows. Oh, absolutely. The more the better. More the better. <laughs> My parents didn't agree, but <laughs> Oh, here's a question, um, and I don't know whether this is public information or not, but somebody's asking, how many violins does Yamaha make per month? I don't know if you guys release uh, production information or not. Um, it's, I can, I can give you, I can give you ballpark numbers, and it's mostly because I don't really know. It, 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 the, 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 thing is, the thing about us is, is we're a global company, so I know in the in the U.S. market that number is in the hundreds, hundreds of violins per month. Uh huh. In the in the U.S. market, and then there's Europe and and South America. Um, Canada is its own subsidiary, and and I don't really know what their sales numbers are. So that's a that's a that's, a, that's the one thing too is that, that you know when you see a. Um, <clears throat> When, when you when you see that when you see the instrument it's like oh we're we're out of this model which like with the pandemic right unfortunately it's it's put a strain on us from a production standpoint because our production our production facilities were closed at the beginning and it closed at the beginning when everybody was told to stay home and right. everybody was staying home and practicing and wanted a silent instrument so the demand increased and it didn't it didn't increase just in the u.s it increased on a global basis so now our production facilities are back up to speed and we're catching up which we're still we're still catching up to the uh um to the demand well the fact that the pandemic is a global phenomenon and it's affecting different countries and of course every country has their own you know their own way of dealing with this and, you know, you've got some country, maybe we're sourcing wood from here, sourcing pickups from there. And, you know, this particular right. country is locked down at the moment. We can't get anything in and out. And what that does, it affects what comes into the Port of Los Angeles. Right. Right. And and, and the port's another story right now, too. I don't even I don't know if we want to go there or not, but the supply chain, the, the supply chain situation now in ports, either bulk departure and arrival is 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 just in a in a crisis and that's affecting every every industry the automotive industry the 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 uh consumer electronics in industry on it it's just that to, to get a container out you from from a port overseas takes three to four times longer and i can tell you that i i i unfortunately i know of a container that arrived in Los Angeles and has been there more than 50 days Ugh. before before we could get it on a rail to one of our warehouses to distribute it and 
and you know we're we're being told sorry charlie everybody's everybody's in the same boat and so on the on the upside yamaha when you got this huge mega corporation you've got economy of scale working in your favor we we do yeah we do on the downside you're shipping everything in containers and containers are getting hung up where you know if you're a guy in in the netherlands making these things one at a time you can kind of send them parcel post and they get okay. through yeah so that's true you know it's it's a little bit of a trade off generally in like a sane world um, you know that economy of scale is working completely in your favor and then you go um, into this wacko bizarre world we're living in now it was a, a container a, a container was dropped at the factory it was loaded the truck came and pulled it away took it down to the, the to the to the shipping yard they picked it up they put it on a on a on a freight on a freight line they sailed it across the pacific that trip took about 3 weeks and then it was pulled off within 2 or 3 days of arrival dropped on the back of a truck or dropped on a on a a, a, a bed a bed for a a train and trained and taken across the country and dropped off in chicago and and a, and a a trucker was waiting for it took it right to our warehouse and it was unloaded and shipped the next day it was it, it was about a 30-day trip, hmm. and now we're seeing somebody. Somebody told me some industries that uh, they're they're finding it um, almost 10 times longer. So can you imagine it? A, 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 can you imagine a, an industry where something was taking a month to get, and now it's going to take nine or 10 months in, in transit? It's it's, an, it's insane. It's it's temporary. Yeah, yeah. It's attributable to the, the the craziness that that we know as 2020 2021 2020 is like the longest year ever i think we're yeah, still in yeah, 2020 20, yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah. we're now in like the 20th month of that year <laughs> goodness so yeah there are global uh supply issues like you'll notice generally when I'm talking to Yamaha, I do have a little bit of snap to me. I would have had nothing but Yamaha violins behind me. And uh, we just, we don't have any Yamaha violins in the building right now. They've, they've been sold and we're kind of waiting for them to come. Um, we're hoping that that's going to be soon. Yeah, I blame that on the customers because they bought them all. Yeah, if it wasn't for those pesky customers. For those customers that want to give us money <laughs> for our products and things like that. We, we've had plenty to go around. That crazy talk. <laughs> awesome well are there are any more questions uh if i don't see any more questions then we're going to go ahead and wrap up here and uh i know ken's got some other places to be he's an important guy he's got to go practice his tuba or something um <laughs> but uh if you guys have more questions later on you can dump them in the comments section and if i don't have the answer then we can get ken to help answer those but uh yeah, thank you guys for loving Yamaha products the way you do and buying them up. And uh, thank you, Ken, for being here with us. Thank you for having me. And uh, we'll see you soon. Hopefully you get a chance to uh, to hang out in person before too long. Boy, that would be great again. Man. Someday. Looking forward to it. All right, thanks, Ken. Thanks, everybody. If you got more questions, you can dump them in the comments section below. Thanks, everybody.